All right, we're on a series called God Junk. This is this series. I'm not getting to where I want to go, and I'll explain that later on. I've got another foundational piece to bring in. That's what I did last week. But the bottom line of this is that we understand God has some plans for you. He's got plans for each of us. He tells us this in Jeremiah 29, 11. And you may get sick of hearing this particular scripture. You might think it's trite. But listen, it's not. It's true. This is the word of God to you, for you, today. God has plans for you. Thank you. God has plans for you, every one of you in this room. He's got plans for. Right. Amen. Plans to prosper you. Now, I need some more prosperity. Spirit, soul, and body. Just saying, it's a full meal deal. It's just, well, don't get all freaked out when somebody says, talks about prosperity, thinking that they're just talking about the prosperity gospel or, you know, the get rich quick scheme stuff. No, that's, I think you should know me by now. I'm a balanced guy, really balanced. I'm, sometimes maybe I'm too balanced, but if that's possible, I don't know. Um, you know, that's why I say no surprises. It's part of my balance, and look what happens, right? God wants to prosper us, not harm us. He, 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 he wants to give us hope. He wants us to live in and with hope. Now, if you don't have hope in life, oh, dear Jesus, please make an appointment. Come and talk to somebody. Come and get some prayer. Because there is so much life to be had regardless of what you're going through right now. And I'm not trying to minimize the struggle. The struggle's real. I get that. Everybody has issues that they have to get through. But he has a hope for you. There's a plan and a future. Have you discovered God's plan for you? Have you understood the future that he's laid out for you? I think most of us would agree that we're doing okay. All right? You doing Okay. Most of us are doing well or good. But we would also admit or believe that there's more. So much more. And that's what God has for us is there's so much more. But there, unfortunately, this issue of theological junk, and, and I'm going to mine this as long as I can. I just think it's a great topic. And I'm going to get to some stuff. You know, I'll eventually get into eschatology, sorry, the eschatological stuff. Everybody understand when I say eschatology? The stuff on the end times? End times stuff, you know, the last day stuff. I'll get there because it fits in with a scripture that I'll eventually get to maybe next week. We have another worship service like this morning. The worship service probably could have just come on, come on. kept going. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. And someday we just may yeah. just say, oh, well, did that order a service and <laughs> just keep going. You know? Yeah, no, but theological junk at times has robbed us. And when I talk about eschatology when we get there, I'll tell you what, it, it's robbed the church of its victory. It's robbed the church of its boldness. And when I say that, I'm speaking specifically of dispensationalism. Because a dispensationalist believes that the, the church is going to fail. And that really what we ought to do is just hunker down and wait for Jesus. And, you know, that just, that just doesn't jive with the Bible I read. You know, I see Jesus walking in power and victory. I see him doing amazing things. I see him in John telling us that we're going to do the same things that he did and even greater. Now, if I'm going to fail, how could I do greater things? So, but we'll get into all of that later. All of this to say that there are the traditions of men. And by the way, that particular tradition didn't start until about 1830. With a guy named Edward Irving. And then, you know, it was... Um, Darby, and then Schofield, and then Ryrie, and you know, and then you just it leads right up into our current culture. And you've got like guys like Tim LaHaye, uh, really teaching doctrine that's not biblically sound, and uh, that's why theological junk matters. It does matter. 
the traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. You know, we're told, we're told to be careful about people who, uh, you know, don't come with word and power. If there's no power in your life, if there's no demonstration of gospel, then what is there? Now, we've all heard strange things, and this is one of those strange things we've heard. And I'll just do a little survey, and you raise your hand if you've heard this. God helps those that help themselves. Right? Pretty much everybody's heard that. That's not even biblical. But I can't even count the number of times I've heard that. I can't even count the number of times I've heard people say that to other people in terms of counsel and advice. I'll tell you who God helps. God helps those who call on his name. And if you roll up on yourself and try and help yourself, you're just going to get some self-help that ain't going to help. And we'll just sit back and ask, how is that going? We need to line up with what the Word says. And just because we're not experiencing something that's in the Word doesn't make the Word of no effect. It makes us ineffectual means that we have a lack, we have a void that needs to be filled somehow, some way, and let God work it out in his time. The main source for God's plan for you is the word. Oh, I so appreciated the songs today. You know, it's the spirit that convicts and it's the word that brings life. Amen? I want to do a quick review of last week. Um, last week we explored a three-part key the keys are important. They open things. They start things. They, they do things for you that you can't do without them. And last week, we looked at a three-part key to achieving the plans and future that God has for you. This week, we're going to look at how you know if you're using that key. I mean, because you could have a whole set of keys. You could be the super of a, you know, uh, 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 of a big manufacturing plant with every key to every door and everything there but they're no good if you don't use them. They serve no purpose other than dangling on your belt and making you look important because you got all those keys. We talked, we asked the question, how's your hearing? Remember? Because all throughout the New Testament, we hear that saying over and over again, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, we all have ears in here. I don't think there's anybody that needs prayer for healing. I'm looking around, I, and, you know, and the only ones I can't tell if they have ears or don't have ears or, you know, if they have a long hair covering them, right? You see, because we know that we can hear but not hear, right? I mean, later on today, if Holly comes in to try and have a conversation with me from 5.30 on, um, I'll hear, but not hear. Just saying. Only being fair, right? And there's a lot out there to listen to. But what is it that we should be hearing? Well, Jesus made it very clear that we should be hearing every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, right? Matthew 4.4, 4, he told us that. That we don't just, we shouldn't be just living in the natural realm. If your life is constituted or made up simply of the natural existence, you know, you get up, have breakfast, your cup of coffee, or in my case, cup of coffee, then breakfast, right? And then more coffee, yeah. and uh, probably more coffee after that. Uh, you know, we don't just get up to exist, to go to work to earn money, to pay taxes, to come home, to do it all over. No, there's more to life than that. We need to be hearing from God. Because we're always on assignment by God. We really are. Whether you realize it or not, whether you're walking in that or not, you are on assignment. So how's your hearing? Some believe, we covered this, that faith is the key to life. Well, I'm not going to argue that because faith is important in life, but you can't have faith without hearing. That's what the apostle told the Romans, right? Faith comes by hearing, and the hearing comes by the word, right? 
So in order to have faith, in order to have hearing, you have to have... Come on now. You need to word up. You see, when you word up, then you will hear... And when you hear, your faith will be strengthened. And when your faith is strengthened, then life becomes more adventurous. I didn't say easy. I chose that word on purpose. It becomes more adventurous. Because you see the dynamic between the world, you know, and Christianity. There is a difference. And as we live and walk in Christianity, there ought to be some challenges. How do I communicate to that scoundrel? Right? There are people in the world that are hard to talk to. I tell you, from my perspective, there are people in the church that are harder to talk to. Just saying. Right? All right. But you need to understand God is always speaking. He is always. He is. He speaks. We listen. But do we hear? Is hearing enough? And this is where we explored Matthew 13, and we took some time and developed this. And Matthew 13 is the parable of the sower. I, I so appreciate that Jesus took the time. He didn't take as much time on many of the parables as he did on the parable of the sower. And he really broke it down and really laid it out there that it's important that we see, hear, and understand. That's the three-part key. That's, you know, you have a key, but it's got to have those those cuts on it, right? In order for it to go into a particular lock and open that individual particular lock. And so the three things that we understand that were the key for God's plans and future for us are that we need to see, we need to hear, and we need to understand. Because if we do not have an accurate understanding of God's word, we will miss out on his best for us. Can you see, do you see the handiwork of God in your life? Are you hearing what he's saying to you and to the church? Listen, he's talking to the churches. And I'm telling you, he's talking positive. He's talking victory. He's talking, come on church, get ready stuff. And he should be talking that to you as well. Building you up, getting you prepared for what's, what is yet coming. This place pretty soon isn't going to be able to handle us in one service. And are you understanding his word? You see, because the, the parable is very clear. Jesus took the time to go back to the prophet Isaiah, and in verse 15 broke it down. He, says, he said, if we're seeing with our eyes what God is doing, and hearing with our ears what he's saying to us, and understanding in our hearts, then we will turn. We will have a course adjustment. We'll have a life change. Something will happen in our lives. We'll turn, and then he says, he will heal. Now, this particular healing he's talking about, spirit, soul, or body. It could be relational. It could be anything. That whatever the need is, he'll heal it. If you will just get a hold of his word, and by the way, his word covers every circumstance that you've ever faced are facing or will face and if you think or you're in a situation where well I'm just not sure about the circumstance that I'm facing right now I, I don't have a word for it well then you need to come talk to one of the deacons the elders you know or uh, us and I prefer you start you know get the, the, listen folks this church is all about getting the, the highest possible care at the lowest level. Why is that? Because I believe in the priesthood of the believer. Something that I'll teach. Oh, I'm getting off. Oh, dear Jesus. I so believe in the priesthood of believer that this communion has long been taught by the church to be a sacrament that is only done and oversawn by those who are licensed or ordained, the priests, the ministry in the house, right? right. Tracking with me? Yep. But where did this start? Jesus. Before then, it's Old Testament. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It started with a Passover lamb. The very first time this, and it refers to the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper refers back to the Passover, was done by the heads of households. Not just the priests. So how can we stand up here as a leadership and say, well, only the pastors can oversee communion? No. That we are in a priesthood of believers. This is what the New Testament teaches is we're all kings and priests unto our God. There's nothing that I do that you shouldn't be doing. Wow, let me say that over here. Let me try that over here. There's nothing that I'm doing that you shouldn't be doing. Yeah, see, I got to, there you go. I better get back on track, dear Jesus. Do you, do you hear the, the heart of that? I mean, that's what and how, but the why is because God's love. He loves each of us, and he wants us all involved in his plans and purposes. Jesus really, really went on to clarify in Matthew 13 this whole parable uh, uh, what happens when people receive the seed of the word, the word of the kingdom. He goes right down into the nitty gritty and it's so important to understand that he tells us what happens when you and I receive the word of God. Every time the seed is planted, something happens. Every time something happens. Now, sometimes that something isn't so good. There's always potential. This word in our hearts possesses power. It possesses the potential of heaven. But Jesus said there's, you know, four things. He breaks it down. He, I called them G1, G2, G3, and G4, right? I think maybe we should get some t-shirts with a big G4 on them. Because group one were those that were by the wayside. Remember, they, they received the word, but they didn't understand it. And if you're under a teaching or a ministry where you're receiving word, but you don't understand, you, you need to do something about understanding. Figure to ask some questions. Dive in. Read some more Bible. Do whatever is necessary. Review the message. Get my notes. Whatever it takes. Because we understand the G1 people, if they don't understand the word, it says the wicked one or the evil one. Or in Luke, he says the devil comes and snatches away that which was sown. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like the devil rolling up in my house. And I'm certainly not going to stand around and just say, go ahead. Take it. I don't get it. Take it. Man, I'm telling you. So they're by the wayside. And, and, and generally speaking, I believe that these are people who come to church but aren't saved. There are people that are in your life that you're, you're, you're sharing the gospel, but they're not getting it. They don't understand it. And you need to change your prayers for them. You need to understand that as you're sowing seed into people's lives that are not safe, that there is a veil, there's a blindness. And you need to pray that Jesus breaks through that and that the word will have entrance into their soul and the lights will come on. Otherwise, the devil will come in and just snatch what you just sown. he just come right behind you and go, ha. I say we kick little devil booty and pray those people through. Amen. Amen. G two the, the the people it says they're you know they're 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 shallow. Now I think that we've all gone through periods of shallow Christianity. Honestly, I think we've all received the word. It says they hear and they receive, but they have no depth in themselves, right? And so 
when trials or tribulations or a test or temptation comes, they fall away because of the word. It says because of the word. And the best, the easiest one I can, I can touch in on this would be healing or tithing. Those are the quickest two that come to my head because, you know, if you believe, by his stripes I'm healed and I believe that, then why did I get that cold? Well, it rains on the just and the unjust. Maybe I, maybe I was out in the cold without a jacket for a little too long. Maybe I didn't get enough sleep. Maybe I'm responsible for some of my actions. Maybe I set myself up to receive, you know, my, uh, put my body in a position that it couldn't fight off the virus. Probably why I got the cold. It's not God's fault. It was probably my fault. I probably did something unwise or foolish. Listen, we know. Oh, I should have brought that today. I, I had this, this advertisement for smokeless tobacco is in my latest uh, uh, Field and Stream magazine. You know, they're pretty proud of their smokeless tobacco. Full page, two, front and back. But do you know a quarter of that page or a third of that page at the bottom says, Warning. Using smokeless tobacco is addictive. We also know that it causes cancer. We know that if you smoke cigarettes, that you are risking lung cancer. And there's a very high probability that you'll get cancer. Now, will smoking send you to hell? No. It'll just make you smell like you've been there. Right? But if we do something, if we behave in certain ways, there are consequences. There can be consequences. So tithing, I tried tithing. I, the windows of heaven didn't open for me. Well, you don't try tithing. You know, I did it once. That's like investing once in the stock market, you know, and you chose the wrong, you chose the wrong investment thing. It went bankrupt, and you say, well, I'm never doing the stock market again. You know, I'm not doing a 401k. Worthless. Well, you know, those are not things you just try. Those are long-term commitments. That's what retirement's all about. Is ask Corbin, he'll tell you. It's not once and done. You start young and you build all your life if you want to do it well, right? Amen. Corbin should say big, loud amen. <laughs> By the way, he is a financial advisor. If you need some help, see him. I send people to him because he tithes. Amen. Where are we at? G3, right? Now, these are... These are an interesting group because the last group had germination and a sprout, right? They had things started to grow in their lives. They're, they're looking, this, everything is looking right, but it, it came to nothing because of temptation and trial. The next group, the seed grows into a plant. And yet it says the cares of this world then come and choke. This reminded me, and I didn't get into it last week, but there's a story of the fig tree in the New Testament. And Jesus comes up to this fig tree and he's looking for some figs. He's hungry. And there are no figs on it. And in one story, he just says, no more fruit on you forever. And they just keep walking. The next day they come back and it's all shriveled up and dead. And the disciples go, oh, how did that happen? And then he talked to them about faith, just a mustard seed of faith. You can move mountains. And he used that as a natural illustration. Another story, and by the way, the Bible says it was not the season for figs. Now, I don't want to really get off here today, but you see, you're supposed to be ready in season and out of season. There should be fruit all the time. Not just when you decide. But that's a whole other message. I, dear Jesus, help me. They're planted, but the cares of this world just choke. The distractions of life choke the word. And yeah, these people are successful. Everything's looking good. They're rocking and rolling. They've got finances flowing. Life seems like it's great, but there's no fruit. But if you know anything about God, God is looking for fruit. 
Fruit matters. There's another banner for you. <laughs> Hashtag fruit matters. <laughs> Let's start a fruit matters movement. <laughs> then there's G4. G4 is the good ground, right? The seed comes in, they receive the seed, and they keep it. They tend it. They do what we're supposed, they do what Adam was told to do in the garden, to tend it and keep it. So the word comes in, and you hear this. You, you, it's not a revelation. It's really an illumination. The lights come on for you. It's like, oh, I get it. But when you get it, then you have to hang on to it. You can't just like, oh, I get it put it on the shelf isn't that a nice little trophy it don't work that way you got to work it you got to stay after it and then he says then you'll be fruitful you'll produce fruit now today we're going to talk about what makes that key the see here and understand effective right because you need to see here and understand but there's one more step that must happen when you see here and understand and I believe it's the proof of understanding. And the proof of understanding would be doing. You see, because if you really understand investing, you do it. If you really understand budgeting, you do it. If you really understand prayer and what it does for you and those around you, you do it. You see, there, I can say this. There are times that I pray more for Holly, not, and I'm saying not for her, but for her because of me. Right? You get, you get my drift? Because she needs me to pray or she wants me to go away. <laughs> right? I mean, honestly, I'll just say it. If I don't pray, I'm grumpy. I mean, no food, no prayer. Oh, dear Jesus. The world. But that's just, that's too much information today, isn't it? <laughs> Open your Bibles to James, the book of James. We're going to let Pastor James talk to us today. Yeah, yeah say uh-oh because some people know that James just really laid it down he put it right out there James chapter 1 let's pick it up in verse uh, 21 it says uh, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness now hear this and receive with meekness the implanted word now can I just tell you that meekness is not weakness Moses was the meekest man known. Moses. Now, I don't think anybody could be weak and lead over a million people. It just isn't going to happen. And when you have a brother like Aaron, right, and a sister like Miriam, there's no way you can be weak. He was meek, meaning that he just was open to other people's opinions. And he's, we see that when he meets with his father-in-law. And his father-in-law tells him, listen, the thing that you're doing is not good. Meekness is just about being humble. Not being the person who thinks they know it all. I, there are too many people outside of the church that I know that are like that. They know everything. It's like, oh, just give me a break. Anyway. We receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, your mind, your will, your emotions. If you've got anything going on in your mind, your will, or your emotions, here's the answer. It's the word. You need to word up. It'll save your soul. It'll touch. It'll heal. It'll bring deliverance. It'll do whatever is necessary in you to bless you. But you have to receive that implanted word. Verse 22 says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Be doers. 
not hearers only. So it's not enough to hear. We heard from Jesus, it's not enough to hear. We have to hear and understand. Now we're here seeing in the scriptures, Pastor James is saying we have to hear and do. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's this. It's a law of liberty. It's not bondage. It's not a list of don'ts. It's really just a list of do's. Perfect law of liberty. And continues in it, it is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So if you're looking for blessing in your life, become a doer. Be a doer. Don't just sit around and think, okay, where's that blessing? (laughs) Let's look at this in another translation. How many have had an opportunity to check out The Voice? Not the TV program, but the Bible translation. I broke it down for you. Listen to this. James 1, verse 21. So walk out on your corrupt liaison with smut and depraved living. And humbly welcome the word of truth that will blossom like the seed of salvation planted in your souls. See, that's what the word does. It's planted in there and it grows salvation. And salvation is something we we were saved, we're being saved, and we're going to be saved. It's something that just continues to happen. It continues to bear fruit. It continues to process within us. Verse 22, put the word into action. If you think hearing is what matters most, you're going to find yourself, you're going to find you've been deceived. You see, we've been hearing great preaching in the U.S. for a long time. Decades. Decades. We've received amazing teaching. And where are we at? I tell you, it's because we're not doing. And only you can define what it means for you to put the word into action. And each one of us, that really means something different to put the word into action. And the Holy Spirit will help you. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will tell you. In fact, for me, not too long ago, putting the word into action just simply meant picking up the phone and calling somebody. Verse 23. If some fail to do what God requires... It's as if they forget the word as soon as they hear it. Hmm, does that sound familiar? Kind of goes back to the parable of the sower. They receive the word, but somebody comes along and snatches it. One minute they look in the mirror, and the next they forget who they are and what they look like. However, it is possible to open your eyes... And take in the beautiful, perfect truth found in God's law of liberty and live by it. Notice that he wove in this whole hearing and seeing and doing. If you pursue that path and actually do what God has commanded, then you will avoid the many distractions that lead to an amnesia of all true things and you will be blessed. Man, it's as if James was standing there when Jesus taught on the parable of the sower. And he just had a different way to bring it out. James is saying, your word group, your G group, is up to you. Whether you're G1, G2, G3, G4. Whether you're by the wayside, you're having the devil snatch things from you whether you're shallow 
You got stones in your heart, your field, no depth. Temptation is the thing that you are facing the most, and trials. Or if the cares and the distractions of this world are on you, James is saying that's up to you. If you want to be good soil, if you want to produce a hundredfold, see, hear, understand, and do. And I want you to know, church, I believe in you. I, and I wish I had the time, I'd go person to person to person to person and look you all right in the eye and say, I believe in you. I believe in you more than you believe in you. You know how I know that? Because I knew others that believed in me more than I believed in me. And you know why it's that way? Is because you see your failures. You look through life through your own lenses of failures and shortcomings and the processes that you're working through. And you think everybody else seeing you the same way. It's not true. It's not true at all. In fact, when I, look on, when I look on people, I see giants, I see heroes, I see faith, I see, I see life, I see potential, I see overcomers, I see champions for Christ. Even if you are thinking through and thinking, oh, my blemishes. You see, you look at your limitations too much. You think your circumstances have disqualified you. No! Your circumstances absolutely qualify you. They qualify you to minister to somebody who is in the same struggle you are. God never wastes pain. He never wastes the experiences that we go through. Those things that we go through, we go through them to come out on the other side as champions and victors so that we can minister to those who are still going through them. And the struggle is real. I see your true potential. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Now, how can I say these things? Because Jesus believes in you. He does. He, he believes in you, and I can prove it. How many here believe that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing? When the whole, the whole story, right? I believe he still knows exactly what he's doing. All right. That's good. Do you believe his ways are perfect? All right. And do you believe that he came only to speak the truth? Yes. Amen. And do you know that Jesus is praying for you? Yes. Now, who do you pray for? Don't you pray first for the ones you love the most? And people that aren't in your, your love radar typically aren't, unless you're praying for kings and those who are in authority that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. Right? But the ones you pray for first and most are the ones that you care about. Jesus cares. He believes in you. And let me just, oh, dear Jesus, help me. Let's do this. Let's at least finish today, okay? Is that okay? Can we do that? Yeah. Turn to John 17. I only got a few amens there. That makes me a little nervous. Listen, the game's not till 5.30. I promise I'll have you done by then. John 17. John 17, if you've got your Bible, you should turn there. It, and really, I believe you should underline your Bible. You should make notes in your Bible. You should mark it up. You know, uh, uh, somebody said that a, the, a, sign, the sign, a, a clean Bible is a sign of a dirty life. Right? <laughs> John 17. Listen to verse 20. He says, My prayer 
is not for them alone. And he's talking to the disciples. He's, he's, Jesus is in prayer with the Father, to, really talking about the disciples. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who, be, who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Now, I could really get off and, and preach that. This is what's going to be coming in the days ahead. You're going to see the body of Christ coming together. Now listen, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, if you want the world to believe that God sent Jesus, you, you need to work on the unity factor. You need to get together with more Christians. You need to be in fellowship. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me. Oh, that just blew me away. Just stop. Right? Just stop. Stop. Hold the train. Stop. Jesus just said something that, that just ought to blow you away. I have given them the glory that you gave me. I challenge you over this next week. Do a study. Father... Show me that glory. What does this mean? Because Jesus is saying that he's given us the same glory that the Father gave to Jesus. Whew. That they may be one as we are one, and I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought it to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me. And have loved them even as you have loved me. You see, God cares. He cares about you. Jesus is praying for you. Because God cares, he is praying for you. And the Holy Spirit is also praying for you. Turn to Romans 8, last, last passage for today. Romans 8. We'll pick it up in verse 26. Listen to this. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So now we've seen a passage, Jesus is praying for us. Now the Holy Spirit saying that he will pray for us, but his praying for us comes through us. It comes through us. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Another bombshell. The Holy Spirit, when he prays, he's praying for you and I and for those in our lives according to the will of God. Now, we don't know how to pray for him sometimes. I don't know every detail of your life. And that's why I do what Paul says. I pray with understanding and I pray in the Spirit. Because when I pray in the Spirit, I'm praying according to the will of God. What God wants prayed for you. That's what's going on. And we know all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. Now, in this section, you just need to settle your call today. I get it. The struggle's real. I get it that the thief comes. But listen, we know all things work together for good to those who love God. If you love God today, you can expect good to come your way. Those who are called according to his purpose. Well, how do, I, how do I know, Pastor, if I'm called according to his purpose? You're here. Yeah. That's pretty evidentiary that you're called. For whom he foreknew, and by the way, he knows everybody, and he knew that you would say yes to him. And if you've said yes to him, then you qualify for all which you're just about ready to hear. For he... 
For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. To the image of his son. Conformed. Meaning, you should look like Jesus. And that ought to be our struggle. How do I look more like you today, Jesus? How can I look more like you? And it's not about how we do our hair, whether we have tats or earrings or nose rings or lip rings or tongue rings or finger rings or toe rings or any thing like that. He wants us to be in the image of his son that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, though these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, meaning he's removed your sin from you already. All the things that you're looking through, he doesn't see. And whom he justified, these he also You have your Bible open? This is these he also glorified, meaning that glory that Jesus said that he gave to us, he's making effective in us. You see, there's supposed to be glory in the church. And we're the church. So the glory should be coming through us. So what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Does it matter that somebody doesn't like you at work? No, if they persecute you for righteousness sake, blessed are you. Count it all joy. Keep your witness and your testimony true. Listen, verse 32 tells us something, and I, I don't have time to unpack all of this. And this is the struggle, my struggle every week, is there's so much in here that I want to give to you that I can't even get a series done. Come on. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I want to challenge you today, if you think you're under-resourced, you're not hearing the Word of God. You're not understanding the Word of God. He will freely give you all things. He will as we walk with Him. Oh, there's so much in here. Who shall bring a, guard, a, a charge against God elect? It's God who justifies. He's the one. You quit bringing a charge against yourself for crying out loud. Do you think you know better than God? I mean, let's be real here today. I can't help you if you think that what you got going on here and out there trumps what he just said here. It's God who justifies. It's God who removes transgressions and sin, who washes us and makes us new, who gives us everlasting life and recreates us in his own image. Listen to this, verse 34. It goes on to tell us he's at the right hand of God. We know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Again, he's saying Jesus is praying for you because he cares. He loves you. You're the object of his love. He's praying for you to see, to hear, to understand and do. Jesus is praying for you. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm a simple guy. But I'm thinking, if the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke everything into existence, is praying for me, hashtag prayers matter. 
and Jesus' prayers matter most. Think about it. Think about it. Don't let anybody put a charge against your dreams, your hopes, your visions. Hebrews 7.25 says, since he always lives to make intercession for them, Jesus is making intercession. He's praying. Boom, boom, boom. Settle it. Jesus is praying for you. He's for you, not against you. It goes on to say that in here. It goes on. Who can separate us from the love of God? Can persecution, can tribulation, can anything separate us from the love of God? So why are you separating yourself? Why? Why not just bask in His love? Why not just confess, you know what? God loves me. Jesus loves me. <laughs> love is such a powerful thing. Listen, God has plans for you to draw you near, to walk with you, to talk with you, to pour His love into you. Now, I needed to settle all of this before I could go on and teach the rest of this message. Because where I want to get is in the doing side and understanding why we do what we do. We need the why, not the what and the how. The church has had the what and the how forever. We need to get a hold of the why. And the why has everything to do with life and love and liberty. And it has everything to do with now. Right now. Would you stand with me? You see, we need to receive the word. Meaning that we need to see it, hear it, understand it, and do it. Do something with it or about it. There is some word that you work out. You go and work on like evangelism. You hear a word on evangelism. Well, you need to share your faith. You need to witness. And then there's some word that you got to do something about it. Like when you encounter the love of God and you haven't been letting the love of God touch you. You just need to let the love do something in you. As we close, if there's anybody here today, and I'm going to say it this way, because we're bold in our generation with every head up and every eye open. If you need to make Jesus Lord of your life, you, your hand should be up there. Help! Right now, without a doubt, reaching out to the God of heaven who loves you and gave himself for you. And likewise, if you haven't been hearing, if you have had eyes but have not seen and ears but have not heard, you need to ask Jesus to heal your eyes and heal your ears. And I'll tell you how that happens. Word up. Feast on this and you will have a feast in your soul life and liberty the love of god will saturate you and if you need victory in this life today you just simply need jesus and his helper is there anybody here today that needs victory today put your hand up father in the name of jesus i pray that by your spirit the spirit of Almighty God, Shalom, come upon these who are reaching out this very moment, heart to heart, spirit to spirit, to grab a hold of the good things that you have for them. Father, the plans and the purposes, but more importantly, the love that your glory that you gave to them would rise up within them and begin to flow through them. Father, the rivers of living water, the spirit that you spoke of, that would come to us and help us begin to flow through them again in a mighty torrent in a, in a river a river that increases 
day by day, week by week, month by month. It may start out as a trickle, but it ends up as a river too wide to cross. Father, I ask for your best blessing upon your loved ones here today. Each and every one that are in the hearing of this word. Help them to see and understand and then do the things that you're speaking to them to do in Jesus' name. And all the receivers said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.